we know it was imminent. This was an intelligence-based assessment uh, that drove our decision-making process. We know what happened uh, at the end of last year in December, ultimately leading to the death of an American. So if you're looking for imminence, you needn't look no further than the days that led up to the strike that was taken against Soleimani. There were a series of imminent attacks that were being plotted by Qasem Soleimani. We don't know precisely when, and we don't know precisely where, but it was real. Good morning and welcome to AM Joy. So which is it, Mike Pompeo? Was it super secret imminent, but so secret we can't tell you imminent or backwards imminent? Because the bad thing already happened, which really isn't what imminent means, or, or is it imminent imminent? Because it's not clear from that migrating answer field that you and Team Trump America World Police actually have a justification for killing one of Iran's top military officials and making America less safe. I mean, you are the Secretary of State, so, like, you're supposed to, like, know the answer, right? Not that your boss is doing any better at keeping the whole justification story straight. Soleimani was actively planning new attacks, and he was looking very seriously at our embassies and not just the embassy in Baghdad. Do they have large-scale attacks planned for other embassies and if those were planned, why can't we reveal that to the American people? Wouldn't that help well, your I can, case? I can reveal that I believe it would have been four embassies. Now, for those who have been keeping along and following along, did you catch Pompeo's attempt to make it all sound like business as usual by telling reporters that the so-called threat to embassies was revealed to lawmakers in a classified setting as per the norm? Last night, the president said it was a threat to embassies, including to our Baghdad embassy. Why can you say that here and the president could say it at a rally in Toledo, but no one said it to lawmakers behind closed doors in a classified setting, as multiple senators have since said? We did. Uh, except they didn't. Enter Tea Party Republican Senator Mike Lee, who usually falls right in line with whatever Trump wants and whatever Trump says, but who walked out of the classified briefing with lawmakers, you know, the one where the administration is in a secure space and can tell everything to the people who pay the bills. Lee walked out of that meeting and uncharacteristically said his feelings. We never got to the details. Every time we got close, they'd say, well, um, we can't discuss that here because it's really sensitive. We're in a skiff. We're in a secure underground bunker where all electronic devices have to be checked at the door, and they still refuse to tell us. I, I find that really upsetting. Oops. And that actually lined up with what other lawmakers heard, too, that the briefing made no mention of threats to American embassies. And even when Lee snapped back into Trump formation, like 24 hours later, humming, humming, humming on Fox News that, no, 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 wait, Trump is the... And the tragedy of those deaths was not just completely awful for the families of those who died. It was deeply ironic. It was a fresh hit to Ukraine, which has been the subject of extortion attempts by Donald Trump, and which saw a previous airliner downed by Russian surface-to-air missiles in 2014, as yet it was all over. The U.S. supported the Iraqi leader, Saddam Hussein, and we kept supporting him until we didn't. And then we overthrew him in regime change, 2003. War. Irony. It just never seems to end. Fast forward to today, and Donald Trump would like you to believe that he has some secret intel that justifies him pushing the U.S. to the brink of yet another war in that exact same part of the Middle East. And let's just be blunt. Trump's decision to kill a senior Iranian military leader is the reason Iran was on a war footing near its civilian airport. And while Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, stepped up and rightly accepted that country's fault for the horrible tragedy, Iranian officials also noted that the accident was the result of the human error caused by U.S. adventurism. In other words, that it was ultimately Donald Trump's actions that led to the tragedy that killed those 176 people. And no, Donald Trump, we do not believe your rationale for starting all of this. You've given us no reason to believe you over the last three years, and we just don't. Although the dubiousness of the evidence hasn't stopped this country from going to war before. Joining us now is Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, the former Chief of Staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell. And Colonel Wilkerson, thank you for being here. Um, the tragedy of that airliner, um, uh, you know, going down now and all of those lost lives just compounds what already has been what seems to be just a senseless um, new round of military adventurism um, by the United States, this time at the hands of Donald Trump. Your thoughts? Joy, you know, I was 
in United States Pacific Command in Honolulu, Hawaii in 1988. I was one of the principal planners for the force provision package. At that time, Central Command really was nothing. Pacific Command pro provided all the forces, so we were monitoring that situation. Operation Earnest Will, Operation Praying Manus, and then the tragic shootdown of the Ra Iranian Airbus that you recounted. But you also recounted the sordid history of this relationship since 1979, arguably for Iranians since 1953. And I would point out that the recent shootdown how we got here and he hasn't really exactly been consistent uh, in the way that he's explained why we are where we are let me let me uh, play you a little bit of him this week trying to make sense of what he has said we had specific emanation uh, information on an imminent threat and those threat stream included attacks on US embassies period full stop. So you were, you were mistaken when you said you didn't know precisely when and you didn't know precisely nope, where. Uh, completely true. Those are completely consistent thoughts. I don't know exactly which minute. We don't know exactly which day it would have been executed, but it was very clear. Qasem Soleimani himself was plotting a broad, large-scale attack against American interests, and those attacks were imminent. Against an embassy? Against American facilities, including American embassies, military bases, American facilities throughout the region. And, and here is um, Hogan Gidley, um, who is a spokesman for the White House, trying to also make sense of what they've done. And, uh, and this is a tweet by Hogan Gidley. Soleimani, he says, was in fact planning imminent attacks uh, while Democrats and the media quibble over its definition, quick point, when uh, Obama, President Obama, killed bin Laden, al-Laki, and Gaddafi without congressional approval, there were no imminent attacks, and Democrats did not ask or care. Um, President Obama, by the way, did, did not kill uh, Gaddafi. The Libyan dictator was killed after being attacked and captured by a rebel mob. They don't seem to really know the history, but they're trying to make sense of it. What do you make of, of their justifications? This group is the most incompetent bunch of liars I've ever encountered. I served an administration that had skillful liars in it, like Richard Bruce Cheney and so forth. But this administration gets caught every day in its lies and in the aftermath of those lies. I think what you played earlier about Mike Lee, the Republican senator from Utah, saying in his nine years in the Senate, he'd never had such an atrocious briefing, such a bad briefing. I think he's absolutely right. They don't know what they're talking about. Mike Pompeo and Secretary of Defense Esper were planning the strike on Soleimani for at least a month. How about that for eminence? And the statement that he was planning attacks on U.S. forces around the world, I would dare say that probably applies to every commander in Iran and probably half the commanders in Iraq now. So this is utterly ridiculous in the face of international law and indeed our own executive order against assassinations. These people are caught in their lies every day, and it seems like it has no impact on the people who are supporting them, the Americans who compose President Trump's base. I hope I'm wrong. I hope it's slowly eroding that base because any person out there can see that they're lying. But, and they're, what they're doing is they're trying to backpedal because they haven't been able to find, to, to show us any imminence. And apparently they haven't been able to show Mike Lee, who's on their side, um, that they had some sort of imminence that they can point to. They weren't able to do it in a skiff, in a, in a closed meet hearing where everyone was allowed to say what was the truth. They weren't allowed to do it um, to the point that Mike, you know, Lee came out and, and, and went against them. But here's Mike Pence on the Today Show. Um, and here he is also attempting to explain. Here he is. If we were to share all of the intelligence, and in fact, some of the most compelling evidence that, that Qassam Soleimani was preparing an eminent attack against American forces and American personnel also represents some of the most sensitive intelligence that we have, it, it could compromise those sources and methods. So, you're, I mean, they, they don't, they're saying that they can't share the most sensitive intelligence. Why wouldn't they share it with members of Congress such that Republicans wouldn't come out and blast them? Well, the main thrust of Mike Lee's protest was the disdain that the briefers showed for the Senate. <laughs> that's unparalleled. I, I don't think that's ever, I don't think a senator has ever said anything like that about the Pentagon and the State Department since 1945. I really don't. I'd have to check, but I really don't think. 
And, and let's just look at some other aspects of this. Okay, Soleimani was a was a Quds Force commander, and the Quds Force was responsible for American deaths and so forth and so on. This is a war. We started it. We are waging economic warfare against Iran. International law allows for a state that is under siege by another state to do these sorts of things. I'm not excusing it. I'm just saying that it is to be expected. And let's wash away all the lies and all the cheating and all the stupidity and incompetence with Pompeo and others. And let's just look at what we did. The act we performed, despite its tactical positive nature perhaps, was a strategic disaster. We are now going to have to occupy Iraq, and good luck doing that. 165,000 Iraqi soldiers, however bad they may be, vastly outnumber the few thousand soldiers we have in Iraq. So good luck with that. We're going back to 2004 and 2005, and maybe Mike Esper, or Mark Esper will say, uh, oh, it's not an insurgency. I guarantee you it will be an insurgency, and it'll be Sunnis and Shia attacking U.S. facilities and troops in Iraq. So are you ready for another 165? 5,000 Americans to deploy to Iraq. I don't think Trump's base is. So this is a catastrophe, largely created by us. And the, the, so, and the other thing is, is that it's difficult to trust what's coming out of this particular White House for a lot of a lot of reasons, right? Uh, Donald Trump has not exactly built himself up into a, a character that's that trustworthy when it comes to the things that he does. We know that um, Soleimani uh, had posted memes antagonizing Trump on social media, which is something that is likely to have gotten uh, to Trump. And then there are the things that Trump actually says. Here is Donald Trump on Fox News speaking to his base um, about what he thinks the next step is. Here he is. And then they say he left troops in Syria. You know what I did? I left troops to take the oil. I took the oil. The only troops I have are taking the oil. They're protecting the oil. I took well, over we're taking the oil. oil. We're not taking well, oil. maybe we will. Maybe we won't. They're I protecting mean, we, the facility. I don't know. Maybe we should take it. But we have the oil right now. The United States has the oil. You have Laura Ingram trying to help Donald Trump out of the mess that he's put himself in. The problem is our our leadership is not trustworthy, right? I mean, that what he, Donald Trump just says what he thinks in his id, and then you have Fox News trying to fix it. And a few days later, you have Donald Trump saying, we don't need that oil anymore. <laughs> We've got all the oil we need. We don't need it anymore, even though in 2018, 19 percent of our oil came from the Persian Gulf region. But he's right in the sense that we do have a lot of oil today. So you can't have both stories. The tragic thing here, Joy, with regard to this specific situation with Iran, I think Donald Trump does not want war with Iran. But he has people around him now, sycophantic in their relationship with him, like Mike Pompeo, but dedicated to bringing about a war with Iran. John Bolton on the outside, Lindsey Graham in the Senate, they are all dedicated to a war with Iran, and Donald Trump is trapped by them right now. Yeah, I mean, and to that very point, the Wall Street Journal has a piece out. The 29th paragraph of it is quite revealing, and it says the following. Mr. Trump, after the strike, told associates he was under pressure to deal with General Soleimani from GOP senators he views as important supporters in his coming impeachment trial in the Senate, associates said. And uh, that Donald Trump has said the story, he says the story is fake, and he said they just made it up. But there is the worry that Donald Trump felt that he needed to do this for the war hawks that he needs the support from politically. There might be a burst of truth coming forth from the Trumpster in that regard, because I see him trapped right now. He's he's taken apart his national security decision making apparatus. He has no process. And in the consequence of that, he has gotten people who are dedicated to this warlike posture, and in particular, a warlike posture towards Iran. They want that regime gone from Iran, and they're willing to die to do it. That is to say, they're willing for American troops to Other die to, to do yeah. it. None of them are going to serve, that's for sure, nor any of their children are going to serve. Yep. So he's trapped right now. He's trapped by the very swamp that he supposedly came to Washington to, to drain. He, he has no where to go as long as these people are his principal advisors and they're putting things up before him like the maximum option of, uh, of killing Soleimani. That's a perfect example of what they've trapped him into. Yeah, it's a blue plate special now because he's in political trouble. Um, yes. Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. And coming up, 23 days before the Iowa caucuses, and the brand new Des Moines Register poll has a new front runner. That is next. Welcome back. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi hasn't been mincing words about when she'll send articles of impeachment against President Trump to the Senate, saying that she'd send them when she's ready. Well, Pelosi has been under fire from both parties for her ongoing decision to hold on to them. But that's going to change because just yesterday she released that letter to Democratic lawmakers revealing that she's set to meet with colleagues on Tuesday to talk about next steps, while also signaling that she would send the articles to the Senate as early as next week. Meantime, Republican Senator Susan and Collins says she's working with a small group within her party to ensure that witnesses will be called at the trial. It's all unfolding as President Trump continues to revise his views uh, surrounding all things impeachment, now saying he would support witnesses testifying, but only the ones he wants. Well, I'm going to leave it uh, to the Senate, but I'd like to hear the whistleblower. I'd like to hear uh, Shifty Schiff. I'd like to hear Hunter Biden and, and Joe Biden, you know. So, yeah, if we do that, I would like to have those people plus others testify. All right, joining us now live in Washington, two of the greats, Washington congressional reporter for Politico, Kyle Cheney, whose Twitter feed I keep a constant eye on, and former federal prosecutor and MSNBC legal analyst, Glenn Kirshner. All right, I've been looking forward to this all morning. So, Glenn, Likewise. as the president was talking, I saw you shaking your head. Uh, what's the deal? President Trump has been saying all along he wants a spectacle. He wants all these people to come testify. There's a real danger here, though. One, bringing live witnesses into a Senate trial. And two, the mountain of evidence that Democrats have amassed over the two or, last two or three months only points in one direction. Uh, you know, after 30 years of trying criminal cases, Jeff, to hear somebody, uh, no less the president of the United States, say, I would like all of the witnesses who I think can either help me or turn this into a circus, but I don't want any of the witnesses who can provide sharply incriminating information about the drug deal I was cooking up inside the administration is, in a word, insane. <laughs> and frankly, um, in every Senate trial on articles of impeachment, there are witnesses there have always been witnesses, yeah. particularly in presidential impeachment trials. There should be witnesses, but you know, you can't set up a false equivalency. The witnesses should be relevant to the issue at hand, not the Bidens and the whistleblowers. And maybe we'll find Hillary Clinton's server and put that on the witness stand. I mean, yeah. that's not the way any of this is supposed to work. And, and Kyle, based on your incredible reporting. Do you think there will come a time where Mitch McConnell will actually take a vote and there will be 51 Democrats and Republicans who vote to hear from witnesses? He says we'll make that decision later. Will later ever come? Well, he keeps talking about the Clinton precedent and right. I've been reviewing the Clinton precedent and what happened in that case was they actually took a vote on a motion to dismiss before they ever considered whether to call witnesses. Now that motion to dismiss was defeated. It's a little bit of a different Senate, a different time. So if they overcome that hurdle, then yeah, they would ha have the debate and a vote on calling witnesses. Are there Republican senators that would vote against the broader Republican conference there to call witnesses? That doesn't seem likely either. So while they're kicking the can a little bit on the decision of our witnesses, it doesn't seem like they're in a position where they're actually eager or excited to hear any new evidence yeah. that might be presented. I explain to us what this motion of dismiss actually is because this this is important because when the house speaker was saying for weeks that i want to know more about the arena in which the senate trial will unfold it turns out one of the things that she was wanted more information about is this motion to dismiss which we should say is what it sounds like it would allow senators to say you know what we're done here we're going to move on well i think one of the questions was could they just do a motion to dismiss before any right. part of the trial right. happens and, and if they want to go according to the clinton precedent there'd at least be these opening statements which are actually pretty lengthy there are 24 hours of argument per side which uh, in the Clinton era took three three full days per side of arguing. Um, and so we may get a pretty fulsome argument uh, presented before that motion to dismiss comes if they do uh, adhere to the Clinton standard. Uh, but that would still be in, ahead of any sort of discussion about witnesses, any new evidence that could be entered into the record. Yeah. Can you set the record straight on this John Bolton stuff? Because he says he'll testify if he's subpoenaed. If he wanted to, he could testify on Monday <laughs> without a subpoena, right? It, it, we've seen Lieutenant Colonel 
Colonel Alexander Vindman, uh, Fiona Hill, former administration officials who've all testified un under their own free will. And this notion that President Trump is going to claim executive privilege that would block his testimony uh, uh, totally. That's not.